Hey everyone, uh, my name is Matt Lotter. Uh, I am, am based at the University of Johannesburg. Um, I'd just like to thank, before I get started, I'd just like to thank the uh, current Southern African Archaeology Student Council uh, for inviting me to come and do this presentation today. It's always nice to be asked to, to come back to do this presentation today. So yes, I'm really looking forward to it. I hope you guys are all well. Uh, I hope you are looking forward to the upcoming December break. Uh, I'm sure it's uh, everybody's looking forward to kicking their feet up a little bit and, re and relaxing. I know I'm definitely looking forward to that. But anyways, yeah, let's let's get to it. Just the first couple of slides. I'm just going to talk a little bit about myself, just to introduce myself so you guys know who I am. Um, and, uh, and then we'll get into the, uh, the, the talk itself. Thanks very much. Okay, so um, yeah, as I said, I'm based at the University of Johannesburg. Uh, I'm currently a postdoctoral researcher at the, uh, the University of Johannesburg. I um, graduated from WITS in 2016, and then I headed across to uh, the University of Pretoria, did a postdoc there for three years, and then I've now been at UJ uh, since 2019. Um, that is a picture of me on the bottom left there, uh, up in uh, northern South Africa. Uh, I was in the Kruger Park. Um, I am currently the managing and production editor of Southern African Field Archaeology. Um, there's just you know a couple of images here showing the the, the journal kind of landing page, uh, and then the, the the cover page of the actual journal. Um, that is a newly revived journal that is that is online. Southern African Field Archaeology uh, was a journal uh, that published between the the 90s and kind of the mid 2000s. Um, then the the journal stopped, um, and over the last year or so. Uh, we've now uh, got the journal up and running again, and it's and it's all online. Uh, so obviously, my talk today is going to be a little bit aligned with, you know, kind of my experiences now as the managing and production editor, and and, and I hope I can share some some skills and tips with you today in terms of how you can uh, potent, you know potentially publish your your research and your work. But um, I'd also like to talk a little bit more generally about things that you can do as an individual. Um, or when working with others, uh, you know, in terms of how you can you can get published. Anyways, but we'll, we'll get to that in the next few slides. Um, I've just put in an image there of my Google Scholar profile as well. So if you if you want to have a look at any of the, the research that I've done, uh, you can just type my, my name in into Google Scholar there and, and my papers will, will come up. Um, and obviously, you're welcome to go and have a look at, at, at stuff there. Um, but then, yeah, the next couple of slides, I'm just going to tell you a little bit about my um, experience in archaeology. So when I started undergraduate, I obviously showed a very keen interest right from the beginning, uh, from first term in, in first year. And, um, you know, I started just looking for opportunities to get into the field, um, you know, to get into, uh, you know, parts of the country where people were doing research, where I could then learn from, you know, various, you know, professors and, and people who are working at Vich University, but not necessarily, um, you know, colleagues uh, elsewhere internationally and stuff. So... It all started in, in June of, of first year, middle of the year, um, when I happened to walk past the department notice board and there was an advert for a um, excavation happening in the Northern Cape at a site called Canteen Copy. And I can't remember what the wording was on the, uh, on the, on the uh, notice, but it said something about, you know, come and have fun, uh, get into the field, do some excavations, work hard, party at night, blah, blah, blah. So I thought, okay, cool, as a first year, sounded very exciting. So I put my name down, or I phoned, phoned the guy who was in charge of the excavation. This was um, being coordinated by um, Dr. George Michael Leader, who was also at WITS, who graduated in 2014. And I spoke to him, and he spoke to me in his American accent. Uh, he was an international student. And... Um, yeah, then I joined that excavation for two weeks, and I think from that point on, I knew immediately that this was something that I wanted to do. That's me standing at the uh, Canton Copy excavation in the bottom right corner, um, which you'll see it actually looks like a big pizza. It was the first radial excavation that was ever done in South Africa. It was probably the worst excavation design we ever could have done. But anyways, that's, that's a whole other separate discussion. Um, but yeah, so it was a great opportunity, or at least introduction to field work. Then later that year... I was given another opportunity to uh, go to the Eastern Cape Drakensberg with uh, Dr. Jeffrey Blundell, who was then the curator of the Origin Center of it, um, and he was coordinating a trip to go and look for uh, rock art sites. So um, obviously that was was very exciting as well. You know, in first year I developed a very keen interest for Stone Age um, research as well as rock art research. Those were my my two kind of interests. So I got an opportunity to get into the field. 
uh, with the researchers who were, who were doing current research. It was great to learn uh, from these uh, various scholars and, and get into the field. And I definitely recommend, if, if none of you have gotten into the field yet, if you are thinking about a career in archaeology, uh, or even if it's to do with geography and, and you're looking at um, various uh, possible uh, career opportunities, getting into the field is a great way to understand the ins and outs of a discipline um, and, and what is kind of required uh, from you. Um, it, even if you get into the commercial sector, for example, heritage mitigation or stuff like that, getting into the field will give you very, very, very good experience and give you a greater understanding of the concepts that you learn in the classroom because you can see them in practice um, you know, when you're standing in the field looking at excavations and profiles and stuff like that. So, yeah. Okay, guys, uh, just quickly, this video shows um, the sites that I've worked at across the, the country. Um, I've, I've worked at a range of uh, different sites, you know, kind of spanning all periods the, of the, you know, the Southern African record, uh, you know, from kind of historic sites all the way back to, to earlier Stone Age sites, so Middle Stone Age, Later Stone Age, a lot of rock art sites as well. Um, I've, I've had the, the privilege of, of working uh, in Lesotho as well. I was in, involved with the um, PGS work uh, up there in the Lesotho Highlands. Um, I've also done some work in um, southern Botswana uh, as well. And, in, you know, in 2016, I was involved with some uh, work at some Paleolithic sites in the Sanmanshia Basin. Uh, in, in China as well. Um, but I think collectively, you know, this, this work has obviously uh, provided me with um, a lot of experience and exposure, uh, you know, to, to different types of methods that are applicable in different types of environments. But importantly, uh, it also exposed me to, to different colleagues, you know, working in these different types of areas. I think that's very important. Um, when I get into, you know, my, my talk uh, over the next few slides, um, and, and if you, you have a look at the work that I've done in the past, um, as much as publishing is, is something that you can control and obviously you want to shape your career and you want to identify your, your own research niche, um, it's very often a, a, a team effort, um, you know, where you're working with people from diverse backgrounds. Archaeology is very multidisciplinary, so very often we have to work with uh, different people, often from different continents, who bring a different experience to the team. Um, and uh, that's that's obviously been very important. And, and you know, when you work with different people, it helps to shape your thoughts, uh, and it develop develops your critical thinking skills as well. Uh, you know, in, in different ways. So um, yeah, that's pretty much that. So let's get into the uh, into the talk. So really, this presentation today uh, is a collection of random thoughts and tips that I feel have helped me to to publish regularly um, over the last few years, but. You know, obviously, we are all different. Uh, we, we work differently. Um, and, you know, the things that have worked for me in the past over the last few years may not necessarily work for you. Nonetheless, I will, I will share these, these things with you, and, and hopefully they are helpful. Um, you know, as I, as I mentioned in one of the earlier slides, you know, these are things that either you can do yourself or while working with others. And I think it's very important to just reiterate the while working with others part because uh, archaeology is so multidisciplinary. Uh, very often we are working in teams, and obviously when you work with teams, um, you know, there's there's different personalities. People come from different backgrounds. There may be, um, you know, language uh, barriers that we have to navigate and deal with. So these are all the things that we, we need to keep in mind when, when publishing. Um, I have broken down these thoughts, of some, uh, although it's a, a, mismatch, a mix mash sorry, of, of thoughts, I have tried to break things down into kind of four or five key areas. I will go through them strategically, um, and they are as follows. So that, you know, this could loosely be called a publishing strategy, uh, but the first things, uh, the first thing I'm going to go through are what things I can personally do to get published. Uh, the next thing would be, what should I do when working with others to get published? So th therein comes the, the kind of team team strategy. Um, what things should I consider when targeting a journal for publication? So that's where um, I'll talk a little bit more about uh, the, you know, the field journal. Um, how should I handle review of feedback? And then what should I do once my work has been published? Okay, so the, the presentation today is going to follow these uh, five key themes. 
Okay, maybe just a, a quick disclaimer before I get into all the details. Uh, a disclaimer in terms of what this talk is not about. Um, I'm not going to be going through what individual journals are looking for. Uh, I'm not going to go through how to get your research published, uh, you know, with reference to actual research. In other words, what, what it is, <clears throat> excuse me, what it is that you're actually doing. At the end of the day, you just want to do quality research. Um, and then you won't have as many problems trying to get your, your papers through, but I'm going to explain this a little bit more as we go. Um, you know, thirdly, I'm not really pitching this as a talk as an editor of a journal. Um, you know, I'm really, me you know, merely sharing my thoughts with you on what has helped me to publish in the past, and, and hopefully this will be uh, helpful for, for some of you. Many of what I'm sharing are actually, are actually life skills, um, which I think are very important. And I mean, you're not really going to get taught that at your, at your universities. Um, so, you know, life skills come through experience. Uh, these are things that I've obviously learned, uh, you know, publishing over the last few years. So I hope that will be helpful. Um, and then just lastly, I'm not going to tell you how to write publishable uh, papers, you know. Um, I want to share tips with you that I hope will help you publish before you even start writing. Um, you know, plus, you know, the majority of you should have access to your university writing centers. So if you know uh, you need to work on your writing skills, you know, go to the people that know uh, what they are doing, uh, and they will be uh, able to advise you uh, as as best as as best as they can. Um, all these things aside, though, what I will do in this talk is to encourage you all to publish your work. Um, really, everyone can you know can do it. It does take time. Uh, it does take effort, of course, um, and it absolutely requires hard work and motivation and determination as well. You know, really, you know, one has to be uh, willing to put in the hard hours. And you will be rewarded uh, for your efforts. And remember that publishing is something we have to work for. <clears throat> you know, we can all do research. Uh, not everyone does good research, of course. Um, but this is why we have the peer review system. Your work is sent out. It's read by other specialists in the field. And then based on the combined experience uh, of your reviewers and the journal editor and, and their feedback uh, on your manuscript, um, you'll then know what needs to be done before uh, it can get published. You know, putting in the hard work and time beforehand when you conceptualize your research uh, and your research papers will put you in a far better position down the line to then publish. So, you know, in essence, the quality of your work should speak for itself. And then ideally all the reviewers would, you know, ideally all the reviewers, what they need to do is comment on where your manuscript should be strengthened as opposed to them calling for it to be, you know, rejected or declined by the by the journal. But again, it starts with you and your willingness to put in the hard work, but this is something that you can do. And I say that it's something you can do because it, it will just require some, some adjusting, you know. Uh, new routines always feel a little bit uncomfortable. Um, and, and, you know, one must remember that when you're writing for an assignment, you know, at university, for example, or if you're writing an honest project, you, your writing is going to be very different for the purposes of publishing. Uh, because your audience changes, you have to sh you know, shift your thinking away from you know, writing for your lecturer or writing for your examiner and instead focus on writing for your colleagues and for the archaeological community. So obviously you're writing for a much broader um, audience. Um, you know, this should be driven by a deliberate shift in your thinking in terms of how you pitch your work. But this is, again, this is something you could do. Many others have done it before. Um, very often, having come from challenging backgrounds, uh, coming from different education systems, very often writing in different languages. Um, so it's definitely something that you can do. Um, and, you know, very often there are people out there to help you, um, you know, kind of shift your thinking and develop your thinking. Very often this will be, um, you know, those that you've been working with at your universities, whether it's your lecturers, whether it's your super supervisors or whether it's potential co-authors uh, that you've identified. So to continue with things that you can personally do, really, at the end of the day, you know, just be enthusiastic. Um, be lacquer, in other words. Be a good person. I mean, know your stuff. Read. It's obviously very important. Um, be approachable, you know, and try to handle your stress levels as best as you can. I know that's easier said than done. And sometimes it does get very stressful when working on these things. Um, but to counteract that, you know, be organized. Be on the ball. Uh, set deadlines and, and know what needs to get done. Uh, be professional. I'll come back to that a little bit later, you know, when working in the kind of team environment. But be resilient. You know, publishing is tough. 
Um, handling re uh, review feedback is, is very tough, and I'll deal with that more a little bit later. But really, you know, publishing requires resilience. I think archaeology as a discipline in general requires resilience. You know, very often we're in the, when we're in the field, uh, we, we are working with, with challenging conditions and stuff. Um, and, you know, that kind of filters down into the, the publishing kind of uh, sector as well. So really you have to, uh, you have to work hard and, and, and be resilient to the kind of pressures uh, that publishing brings. Um, really, you know, you want to drive your own work and your own research, but it's also important to surround yourself uh, with people who believe in you. Um, you know, this is very important. A little encouragement goes a long way, you know, whether it's coming from friends, uh, from family, um, or your, your lecturers. You know, put yourself in a position where you show others your, you, you know, your keen interest and commitment to the field and show them your willingness to put in the work to, to get the job done. You know, looking back at the papers that I've published, um, there's no way I would have published any of my papers had it not been for the support and understanding of my, my family and my friends, my wife, my two dogs <laughs> as well. So um, really, it, it is very important to, to surround yourself with, with pos positive people and positive energy. Um, really, you've got to drive your own research and, and be responsible uh, and control your own publications. You know, be responsible for your own publications, but you know, control the, the direction they're going in. You know, there's a lot that can be said about working by yourself and, and getting things done because you can get th things done as quickly as you want them to, uh, as you as you would want to. Sorry, um, you know. But again, I keep coming back to archaeology being, being multidisciplinary. So remember, at some point, you are going to have to play nice with others, um, and you know, you can't necessarily just c kind of sit in your office by yourself um, and and do your work. You can do that, but you know. You can isolate yourself in the in the community. Really, what you want to do is find a work groove um, and and put in the hours. And really, that comes down to you know sitting in sitting in a chair for ten to twelve hours a day and writing. Um, and and for those of you that have you know done an honours and a, and a masters, you'll you'll know what the kind of bum and seat for ten to twelve hours a day is like. Um, it's it's difficult. You obviously have to take your breaks, but you have to be consistent in your work and committed. So you want to have daily kind of your daily habit needs to be 10 to 12 hours a day. Um, and you're not going to do that for one or, one or two days a week only. You're going to try and do that for five, six days a week, you know, to get your get your stuff done. Good writing uh, takes time to develop. Um, you know, you can also very easily sit on the couch. Um, you know, when you get into postgrad, you know, you, you kind of control your own schedule. And I think that's the one thing that a student sometimes battle with is that shift from undergrad to postgrad, where undergrad you have your, your lecture schedule, you've got your daily routines of you know when you have your, your pracs and tuts and whatever else. Uh, but then when it comes to postgrad, you have your research uh, project to do, um, whether it's an honors or a master's. Sometimes you'll have a little bit of coursework, but that'll be kind of informally or, or kind of casually set. Um, you know, for specific terms, depending on which lecturer you're working with, maybe, uh, you know, a three-hour sit-down session once a week with your, your lecturer, and then you may have some essays to do in between that. But really, you've got to get into a good work routine, and it starts as soon as you start post-grad. Um, so I really do encourage you to kind of adopt, um, you know, the kind of uh, sitting, you know, getting the work done routine. Um, but then again, it is obviously healthy to take your breaks. So, you know, stand up, you know, stretch the legs every now and then or work at a standing desk. <laughs> but um, these are the kinds of things that you're going to have to get used to. Um, so, yeah, so it's easy to sit on the couch and, and wait for those around you to do things for you. Uh, but remember, that will delay your growth. Uh, rather, just be proactive and, and drive your own research. Um, and it will be stressful. You will freak out at times. Just accept this. Uh, and, you know, coming back to the whole friends and family thing, this is why it's good to obviously have the support uh, of others as you move down this road. One of the most important tips um, would be to just focus up, you know, make the main thing the main thing. And what I mean here is that obviously we're all busy, uh, we've got lots going on, uh, but if you want to publish a paper, prioritize it and work on it every single day. Um, you know, in today's world, we're exposed to so much on social media, the news, the TV. Um, you know, one has to really try and cut out a lot of stuff and be deliberate about that to remain focused on what needs to get done. So, you know, for example, instead of opening up Facebook, maybe just flip through Google Scholar for a couple of minutes, you know, and find some papers and download them. Sorry, this is another thing I just wanted to bring up now that I mentioned Google Scholar. Learn how to Google. 
Google is a, a very important, Googling, sorry, is a very important skill. Google Scholar is our happy place as, as academics. Um, you know, empower yourself. We've, you know, I've had people approach the journal saying that, they, you know, emailing me directly, saying, oh, you know, they cannot find uh, out any information, cannot find any details about Southern African field archaeology. Um, but if somebody just took the time to type Southern African field archaeology into Google, literally the first link that comes up is the journal. So, you know, don't be lazy, you know, go and find the stuff yourself. Uh, be very comfortable with um, working with these uh, repositories and, and platforms and stuff in terms of finding finding information. Um, another thing is put yourself out there and get into the field. You know, just coming back to my slides where I was introducing myself. Um, yeah, I d developed a keen interest in, in, in research and specifically Stone Age research because I spent a lot of time in the field and, and had the fortunate experience of working with a lot of um, you know well well known scholars that have published in the field. Um, and I would encourage you to get experience with all aspects of the Southern African archaeological record to find out what makes you tick. Because obviously there's going to be things that you are more interested in um, and things that you're less interested in. And um, you can then kind of decide which direction you want to you want to head in. If you're an undergrad, now is the perfect time because then by the time you get into postgrad, um, you'll be very clear um, about what you what research you want to do, who you want to work with, and you may even be cooking up a project in your head, which is great. Um, and when you do that, you know, getting into the field and identifying the things that interest you, publishing is easy because all you're really doing is you're finding something or discovering something. Um, you know, that is cool in the field, and then you're wanting to tell everyone about it. That's, that's really what it is. So, so don't be scared to, to think big, you know. Um, I've learned the most uh, when working with colleagues who, who look at the bigger picture. This in itself is, is a very important skill, which is absolutely uh, necessary as you, you start your acad academic journey. Um, but, um, yeah, really it's about identifying what it is that makes you tick and then essentially telling a story. And I'll, I'll talk a little bit more to that a little bit later. Okay, so, you know, really any publication just starts with a few words on a page. Um, you know, it could be just a concept note. It could be a single sentence. Oh, I want to address this question, you know, w w whatever it is. It could be a couple of images that you took in the field. Oh, you know, this artifact looks interesting. I haven't ever seen anything like this before. But really, it's just about putting your hands to work. Um, and ideally, you should try, once you develop your, your kind of writing skills, ideally, you should aim, you know, to, to be able to write a thousand words a day, which is roughly three pages. Um, three pages doesn't sound like a lot, but really when you're trying to structure your thoughts and stuff, it can be quite challenging. It also depends on what part of a manuscript you're working on. I find it's, it's very easy to write three pages on methodology um, very, yeah, very easily versus writing three pages in an introduction or a discussion is a lot more challenging. But really, you know, I just want to encourage you all to be committed um, to the process, start to finish. And the reality is some papers take years. Okay, this is, you know, publishing is not something that happens overnight. Um, and, and remember, if it is your project, then it's your responsibility to get the process going. You know, in, in my eyes, an honors or a master's or a PhD student does not, you know, end their kind of um, research once the de degree has been awarded. The research ends when it's been published. Um, and, and since it is your research, uh, it's your responsibility to, to get it out there. And, of course, your supervisor is there to, to help. Um, you know, but remember, they are supervising, you know, another dozen students. They're busy lecturing another hundred students while applying for project funding and while publishing their own papers. So, you know, everybody is busy, but your your supervisors are absolutely there to help guide you along the process. And, and they should, really, because, uh, you know, publishing is, is not something that you can just do by yourself. I think coming out as a, as a student, um, it's very important to work closely with those you have been working with, um, you know, in your postgraduate research. Uh, and then you can start developing your, your writing skills specifically for publication. If I could just say, though, um, write, write, and write, you know, as much as it's, you know, as much as research starts with a couple of words on a page, just write, write, write as much as you can. Some people have different writing styles. Some people will, you know, spit out three pages quite easily, but it's absolutely riddled with grammatical errors and, and typos and whatever else. Then they'll go back and then edit that, and then they'll change it 15 times before they then have their, um, you know, their, their, their final three pages. And that's fine. Um, I, I tend to work a little bit differently. If I write three pages 
uh, those three pages are going to be very close to the, the final product. There may be just subtle tweaking here and there that needs to happen, uh, but I then you know take a little bit more time to get through the, the three pages. So yeah, just find out what, what writing style works uh, works for you um, and know how to get started with writing. That's very important. You know, the reality is we are all writing. You know, we're all typing messages to each other every single day on social media, WhatsApp, Facebook, whatever. Um, you know, maybe just try and avoid the, the LOLs, you know, the hashtags and the JKs, you know. Just maybe try and use some simple, plain English. Um, that's very important, you know, on your WhatsApps, your posts, your tags. Start writing proper sentences with structure, subjects, you know, uh, tenses. Um, yeah, just these are the things you can kind of focus on to, to develop your, your writing st skills. And it, it, it will be tough. Uh, you know, for those of you who watch Brooklyn Nine-Nine, I want to mention the episode where Rosa takes on Scully and Hitchcock in a sitting competition uh, in their police precinct. You know, sitting for 10 to 12 hours a day and writing is not easy. Sitting, just sitting is not easy, you know, for, for 10 to 12 hours a day. Uh, and typing for that amount of time is no easier. Uh, and especially for your brain. So you're obviously going to develop some, some mental fatigue. So start off with a few hours in a day and then build up your consistency. Um, and, and you'll obviously start to get used to the, uh, to the longer days. Okay, so another thing. Um, moving on to the kind of next section here, things I can do when um, together with others. Uh, very often publishing is, is not all about you, you know, really we're in this together. Teamwork makes the dream work. Um, if you don't have a specific skill to get a paper through, approach someone, uh, you know, and offer them a co-authorship on the paper you're working on. Um, and that comes back to being professional, you know, on email, on, on WhatsApp. Don't drop off the radar. Excuse me, sorry, I cannot say this enough, you know, uh, very often, you know, when, when dealing with, with young students and scholars and stuff, and I know this because obviously it's, it's happened, whether it's, you know, through supervising students or trying to collaborate with papers and stuff, um, I don't know, um, people sometimes just drop off the radar and then you don't hear from them for a couple of weeks or a couple of months, you know, really when you're working with a team and you're trying to uh, work towards uh, publishing a research, that's the last thing you need. Clear and effective communication is, is very important. Ideally, you want to be dependable um, and reliable and call it boring. Okay, You want to you want to just be there. You want to be open minded. Um, you want to be that person that somebody can call on um, and, you know, they, they, they can always expect a response from you, a positive response saying, look, you know, yeah, I'm here. Uh, I'm either working on this or I'm not. You know, I've just been busy with some other things. Um, that communication is really important. Very important, are, you know, is establishing ground rules beforehand. Uh, so all of your collaborators know what their contribution to the research is, uh, you know, what the proposed deadlines are, who is in charge of the, the broader project. That's very important. You know, just as you would have a strategy in business to complete a project, it's not different. Or it's not any different when working with a team of specialists um, when you're obviously trying to get your research published. These are the kinds of ground rules that should be established very early on. And obviously, they can change through time as well, depending on uh, everybody's schedules. Again, everybody's busy. So, you know, you may say, look, guys, I want to hit up this, this work. I'm going to draft the manuscript over the next month or so. Then that doesn't happen. You know, you have a family crisis and then you can't work on anything for the next six months. That is okay. But advise your, your co-authors and give them the option to start the process themselves. Okay, more on this a little bit later. So when, when working with others, it's obviously very important to identify your, your strengths and, and weaknesses and then work strategically around these. Um, you know, there will be times when you will work with people who really know their stuff. Um, I'm talking about, you know, seasoned professors and, and scholars you've been reading and citing for, for years. So there may be a time when you're a little bit starstruck. But, you know, just be honest and maintain clear lines of communication uh, to avoid conflicts and, and misunderstandings. As much as research is about writing papers and the science, it is also about people skills and managing people. Um, you know, I come back to the, the idea of you sitting behind your desk all alone. You know, really, you can do that and you can isolate yourself and do your research. But the reality is people make the world go around and we are all different. So be conscious of this and how differently we may, you know, each approach a, a problem. Be accommodating of these different ideas, uh, but also be true to your research and keep it focused in the direction you, you want to head. Um, you know, when you work with a team on a paper, if you've never worked with people on a paper before, you never quite know what experience you're going to have. Uh, in some cases, your thought processes will be exactly on par uh, with some of your collaborators, which is awesome. And in these cases, it's really easy to develop lasting professional friendships that will stimulate uh, future collaborations. Um, 
thankfully this is the type of relationship I have with with most of my co-authors and I've developed really strong friendships with uh, with these people sometimes dealing with your team of collaborators is like riding the furry tractor you know you think things are going well until you realize that the tractor is a bear um, and not all teamwork works period that's a reality and that's fine but then learn from that and then be careful of who you work with going forward and be deliberate about your choices and who you then choose to, to work with. Um, you know, at the end of the day, I've always enjo enjoyed working with people who are genuine, who are reasonable, um, and who do not belittle others because they think they're, they are more, more intelligent. Sorry. Um, you know, this happens often. So please be wary of this and, and protect yourself. You know, work with people that provide encouragement, stimulation, growth, and who challenge you most importantly. It should not be an easy process. You want people there to challenge you and to make you think more critically about your work, but you know that must be done in a positive manner. manner. Um, be open as well. If you cannot do the work, um, say that someone else can go ahead and write up the research and then authorship can be negotiated down the line. And I'm sure Sebastian Bielderman is listening to this presentation, he's raising his eyes <laughs> because I've been dropping the ball with a paper that we've been co-writing for a while. But actually, from the start, with that paper, um, I said that anyone could write, write it up. So, you know, the entire team has really had the chance to take lead authorship and no one has at the moment. But it's because we're all busy at the end of the day. So we will we will obviously get to the research, Sebastian, in the in the new year. But again, just lastly, you know, be careful with who you work with. Um, and I say this with, with love for all of those doing field work and research. But the reality is you're going to go into the field with people who are serious about publishing. And then you're going to go into the field with those who aren't. Um, you know, there are researchers out there. And I use the word researchers loosely who love the field. Um, in fact, that's all they love. And then they never publish their research. So be, be careful. If you're serious about your career, choose to work with you know, those people who put in the time after the field work to get the papers out. That's very important. And you can merely ask what the purpose of any research trip is that you volunteered for uh, and, and when the PI is hoping to get a paper, uh, paper out. Um, and you could then ask how you could speed things up as well. So just coming back to the, the research, um, remember, you know, the goal is to tell a story. And as much as our papers are about data and, and results and, and a solid method, you know, in, in employing basic scientific principles, um, at the end of the day, we are publishing our papers to tell, tell a story about Southern African archaeology or, or paleosciences more generally. You know, have fun with this. Focus on improving your writing skills and, and sentence structure and developing your story across a manuscript. You know, don't present discrete stories in each paragraph. You really have to build your story from start to end, uh, just like in a movie. Um, you know, your reader should come out understanding what the question was, uh, what methods you applied to answer the question, um, that the methods you used were justified, what the results were, and then exactly how you interpreted the results to get back to answering the question. Um, simple. Well, okay, most of the time it's simple. Um, you know, if you can, try and get some experience publishing on different parts uh, of the Southern African archaeological record. And I say this because archaeologists who work on different periods write differently. Okay, if, if, if one was to compare a rock art paper to an earlier Stone Age paper, the difference is extremely obvious. And, and you know, you will have other people saying, no, look, you know, you must develop a, a research niche and identify yourself in a, in a specific area of the Southern African archaeological record, whether it's to do with methods, dating, whether it's to do with Stone Age research, whatever. That's fine, and I, and I definitely encourage that as well. But there is definitely something to be said about writing about different types of um, archaeology and heritage across the country. Um, you know, look at how authors apply ethnographies, for example, you know, and then draw comparisons with the archaeological record. Um, you know, in recent years, I've found that publishing on a slightly broader range of themes in archaeology, I hope at least, has started to improve my writing uh, and has forced me to think a little bit differently while writing as well. And again, it all comes back to the story that I'm trying to tell. You know, it's very important when working with a team as well to be realistic about self-imposed deadlines. You know, don't set unachievable uh, deadlines and irritate your colleagues. You know, be upfront and say, guys, look, you know, I've got a ton of work. I think I'm only going to get to this in the second half of the year then that's fine. You know, really, uh, it comes back to people skills and managing expectations. Managing expectations is very important. Uh, and again, that comes back to clear uh, communication. Um, you know, be organized. You know, these are things you can do personally now. Be organized. Take notes. You know, set your own deadlines. Don't let your co-authors uh, sit around, you know, waiting for something. Um, you know, don't let them be the ones to have to keep reminding you 
to get the work done. Really, the onus is on, is on you, and especially if you are the PI on a project and you're the one shaping the research, uh, just establish these ground rules uh, very, very early on. And um, be conscious when setting deadlines for everybody um, that you also are flexible to work around other people's schedules. That's very important as well. As much as we are all under pressure to get publications submitted, um, you know, many of us have to, you know, publish a certain amount of papers per year at our, at our universities, um, and it may take you several months to, to put a paper together, and you are hoping to get it published within the next six months. Um, let me just say that papers very seldom get published within six months. Anyways, but, um, you know, you, you then can perhaps unknowingly put pressure on your co-authors uh, by saying to them, hey, look, here's the paper. Um, please can you give me feedback in two weeks you know that may not work out you know really what you should be doing is sending an email saying guys here's the paper I'm really excited to get to get your feedback on this um, please could you get back to me with with a, um, a realistic deadline you know would would kind of six weeks be achievable would two weeks be achievable if not please let me know and then we can um, you know negotiate maybe another two weeks or whatever so really it's just about being open and sensitive to to other people's schedules Okay, guys, so now just getting into what you need to consider when targeting a journal, and I'm, on a, I'm obviously going to bring in a little bit of stuff here from, from Field, or at least my experience as the, the, uh, the editor of Field. Um, it's very important to read the ambit of a journal. Um, you know, obviously you're not going to take your archaeological paper to a journal that publishes only on engineering research. So, you know, step one, just, you know, have a look at a couple of different journal websites, uh, read up about the journals, see what type of um, publications they like or what research they normally publish. That's very important. Step two would be to read the author guidelines. Um, you know, I'm not going to I'm not going to run through these for for field. Um, you know, at the end of the day, you're all adults. You can read these yourself. But um, whenever you are ready to publish, read the author guidelines. People don't, but really you need to. Um, because you need to be able to, to structure your uh, submissions in the, in the correct way. You need to use the correct language. You need to use the correct conventions. Some journals are quite flexible with your initial submissions and in that you don't have to do too much to them. Um, and then when, once they're accepted, you then go through the whole um, kind of uh, style and, and language editing process. But really, it's important for you to, to read the author guidelines because often there's you know, other important information there that will help guide you through the publishing process. Step three would then be rereading your paper um, and being honest with yourself. You know, if you're not sure about the quality of your paper, if you think it fits with the journal, get someone you know who knows the field to maybe give it a read before you submit. This is very important, and authors do this all the time. Really, it's a litmus test, you know, and it'll strengthen the paper before you submit and work this into your deadlines. Give your colleagues time to go over it. Um, I, yeah, I can't even count the number of times that I've read papers from my colleagues before they've even submitted them to journals because they've just said, look, you know, I'm just a little bit unsure about this. Would you mind giving it a quick read? Um, you know, don't worry about the language editing, whatever. It's still, it still needs to be finalized. But just look at the broader themes. You know, look at the kind of questions I'm answering. Do you think I'm over-interpreting the data? Just those, those kind of bigger, bigger issues, you know, and those are the things that you want to get done, obviously, before you submit your paper. So after doing these three things here, reading the ambit, reading the guidelines, and then rereading the paper yourself, after, after doing those three things, you should be 95% certain whether your paper is or is not suitable. Um, if your research is poor quality, you can forget about any of these steps, you know, really. So it, it comes back to, to quality research, solid data, original questions or an original approach, and sound conclusions that do not over-interpret the data. You know, if you are still unsure whether your work is suitable, then drop uh, the editor of a journal an email. You know, they'll be able to advise you, and some may even be willing to read your paper before you submit it. You could say to them, look, you know, I've written this paper, maybe not maybe not sending the, the whole paper, but you could summarize the abstract or summarize, you know, the, the key parts of the paper and say, look, this is what I'm doing. These are the types of methods I use. This is the type of data I've got, um, and these were my kind of basic results. Do you think that your journal would be interested would you mind having a look perhaps at the manuscript before I submit it? They'll either say yes or no, or you know, they'll be able to advise you. And you very often save a lot of time by doing this. Um, you know, don't expect a response from an editor within a few days. 
it's probably going to be a few weeks. You know, editors are very busy people. So if you are working to your own deadlines, it's obviously best to contact an, an editor well well in advance. And in fact, some journals do say that, you know, they're very open to, to being, uh, sorry, some journal editors say they, they are obviously open to being contacted uh, in advance before submissions are made, um, just to make sure that uh, the submission is suitable for, for the journal. Um, okay, and sorry, did I mention that it comes back to doing quality research, really? You know, it's all about doing quality research. And this starts from, from honors, really. You know, choose your supervisors carefully. Look at those who publish prolifically. Uh, because nine times out of ten, they, they will be on board with you publishing your research as soon as it is done, you know. Um, and then it comes back to reading. You know, find the gaps in the literature. Establish a research question. Look at what other researchers have not looked at. Um, you know, maybe look at how a particular method, maybe a new one, could change how we interpret the archaeological record. You know, these are the kinds of things you can ask yourself to identify gaps, um, and, and you can then obviously uh, shape your research uh, in a specific direction based on these gaps you've identified. Um, another very important thing, guys, when targeting journals, know what counts and what doesn't count. Um, depending on your, your university and the kind of level that you're at, um, it's often, you know, very important for us to um, accumulate uh, DOHIT publishing credits, uh, the Department of Higher Education and, and Tourism, or Training, sorry, not Tourism. Um, you know, the, the government subsidizes universities for the publications that academics put out, um, and these units are then uh, accumulated based on your publications, and, and if you publish a single author paper, you'll get a full unit, and if you publish a co-publish co a paper, you'll get half a unit, um, so the, 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 the single unit is divided by the number of authors. Um, but it's, it's very important to know, to know what counts and to be wary of predatory journals, for example. Um, you know, book chapters and encyclopedia entries, as, as great as it is to be asked to do these types of things, it's very difficult to claim for these types of publications. And uh, I must be honest, as, as important as it is to um, um, create a diverse publishing portfolio in that you should have publications and peer-reviewed journals, international, local, you should have you know, some encyclopedia entries, you should have some peer-reviewed book chapters. It's really important. But peer-reviewed journal papers definitely count more and they are easier to claim for, and especially if they are an international journal. So if, you, if, if, if I can say anything, you know, if, if you want to be as time efficient as you can, um, you know, when developing your, your kind of research uh, portfolio, focus on the journal publications. And yes, they may be more difficult to get through. It, it's definitely more difficult to get a, a, a peer-reviewed journal paper out versus an encyclopedia entry um, or a book chapter, which is potentially only, you know, peer-reviewed internally. Um, these are the things you have to keep in mind. So, so don't be sucked into submitting your work to, to predatory journals. Make sure you uh, check your university's a list of, of accredited journals. That's very important. Um, and, um, yeah, just try and focus on those journals only. So once you have submitted your work and then you do get feedback from reviewers, um, <laughs> really the first step is to just breathe because this is it is a bit of a roller coaster. Uh, of emotions. Uh, step two would to be breathe some more um, and really just, if I could say anything, ex expect the worst, you know. Um, reviewers can be hostile at times. Um, yeah, I've had really great reviews. I've had really terrible reviews, you know. You can expect comments like, this person has no idea what they're doing. Uh, these conclusions are completely misguided and this manuscript is not worth uh, publication. Um, these authors need to put in more time and effort and do the hard graph that they've been so been trying so hard to avoid. Um, if I did this work, I would have done it this way, X, Y, Z, you know. Um, this work does not fit the journal and it should have been submitted to a more local journal. In other words, read between the lines, they're telling you to submit to a low impact journal. So, yeah, you, you do have to, uh, you know, take some of these uh, comments with a pinch of salt. Um, it is sometimes difficult, obviously, especially when you've been working on, sorry, slaving on something for, for hours and hours and weeks and months at a time. Um, it can sometimes be quite difficult. It, also, it is also very difficult when reviewers don't read the papers correctly and they say, oh, you know, they've left out this and that and that, but meanwhile, it's all there. So, yeah, it can be quite frustrating. Um, but, you know, really, don't be scared to shoot for the stars. You know, go for the big journals, get the tough reviews back, learn and grow from the experience and, and develop a thick skin, you know. Um, you know, step one really, and I keep saying this, is do high quality research 
and then the reviews will be easy. Uh, not always, but most of the time. You know, reviewers are not out there to get you, although I must be honest, there's definitely some reviewers who are out there to get you. But um, <laughs> you can certainly catch them on a bad day. And, you know, the following does not help your case, you know. In your manuscript, make sure there aren't spelling errors. Make sure there's no language errors. Um, you know, guys, and, and I know not all of us are, are English uh, first language speakers. I get that. But unfortunately, English is a language of science. So if you are worried about your writing and your grammar, get a colleague to check it out or, or pay for English editing. You know, there are services available to you. Again, go to your local writing centers and your universities. Poor sentence structure doesn't help. Um, misnumbered figures and tables. Uh, data that do not add up or that are, are or data that are not explained uh, clearly. Poor figure quality, uh, interpretations that go well beyond the data, that is a big no-no, you know. Science is on the side of caution, pretty much the opposite of how Lee Berger makes his claims. Data first, then interpretations, and these interpretations have to be within the context of work that has come before. Um, when you get your reviews, it's very, very, very important to respond to each point, point by point. Um, and this is more for the editors, um, you know, because editors are very busy. And if you're not abundantly clear with how you corrected your manuscript um, once you've gone through the review process, like using track changes in a Word document, for example, or how you've responded to each of the points raised by each of the reviewers, then the editor will have to sit and sift through your entire manuscript to figure out what you did. And remember, the editor also determines whether your manuscript is accepted or not in conjunction with input from the reviewers, generally two reviewers. So if you make his or her life more difficult, because you simply did not put in the effort to revise your manuscript properly, it will negatively affect your publishing experience and the length at which it will take for your manuscript to be published. So ideally, you know, be respectful to the editors and be professional when handling your reviews and they will, they will return the favor if, if, you, if you are professional. You know, be sincere, be thankful, but be steadfast in your standing as well. You know, reviewers essentially are your colleagues who you may or you may not know, um, you know, they've willingly given up their time, having been asked by the journal, to read your work and to help you make your research better. So, yes, there's sometimes, their comments can sometimes be hostile, but, you know, that is why you should try and put out the best piece of work that you can from the beginning, you know. Thank them for their feedback uh, and for their time. You know, they'll never get it back and their input directly strengthens your work and makes it more well-rounded. Well um, you know, then again, when I, when, I, when I mentioned there, you know, be steadfast in your standing. You know, be careful of those reviewers who can push your paper in a certain direction uh, away from what you originally intended. Sometimes uh, reviewers do try and push their own personal agenda. Um, so be very, be very wary of that. Um, you can obviously have your objections or raise your objections um, with regards to points raised by the reviewers. But then you obviously have to have some um, um, sound justifications as to why you do not agree with these comments, and then you need to explain, explain yourself clearly uh, to, the, uh, to the editor. Okay, guys, so when you do eventually publish, I cannot say this enough, um, celebrate. You know, really, guys, publishing is not easy, so take the time to, to pat yourself on the back. And just remember that, you know, from the time that you submitted your work to the time that it's actually published, it can be a year, it can be a year and a half, it can be two years, it can be even longer. Okay, so really it takes time. Take the time to thank those around you that you worked with. You know, without them and their input, you may have not published your work. Remember to, to thank your family and friends. And also realize that, you know, publishing doesn't always work. 60% um, of the time it works every time. So it's, it's not like every paper that you submit to a journal is actually going to go through. Guys, you're going to have the hits and misses. I've had them multiple times. You're going to work on a piece of, uh, you know, work on a paper for months and months, submit it, and then it comes back with a massive rejection and uh, a comment like, you don't know what you're doing. And then that's it. You know, <laughs> just move on with your life and, um, yeah, get started with the next paper. Uh, and obviously, it's going to be shocking sometimes when it does happen. Um, you're not going to know what's, what's going on, you know, when, you, when your first paper comes out, but it is a time to, to celebrate. Um, another important thing, obviously, is to update your socials and to get the word out. You know, your paper is not just going to magically appear on everybody's desk. Um, you know, really, you have, to, you have to kind of market it yourself. So put together a little mailing list with your colleagues and friends and, and you know, share it around. Circulate it, circulate it to people who you think may be interested in it. Um, and uh, obviously people working in your field. When I mean update your socials, I don't mean uh, Facebook or your Twitter or Instagram or TikTok. Uh, as important as those platforms are perhaps for like, I don't know, 
um, scientific engagement and public outreach and, and maybe interacting with the public uh, you know on a, on a broader project that you may be involved in I can assure you that you know any reputable scientist is not trolling through social media waiting for the next big announcement you know um, really I'm, I'm talking about your academia page your your research gate your ORC, ORC ID page and your scopus as well uh, and if you are serious about being an academic and developing a research profile, make sure above all the other profiles that your Google Scholar profile is is perfect. Um, you know, you should ideally have all your your papers listed with with academia and research gauge. You can list your presentations, your reports, and published material as well. You can start establishing connections with with colleagues in the field um, who are interested in your work. Um, Google Scholar is really nice. You can help you keep track of your H index and your citations, and you can. You can then be quite strategic with how you build on these metrics, um, as you can see how your, your work is being received by the, the community. Um, so really, these are these are platforms you know that people are going to check to see who you are, how good you are, uh, what you've done, and who you've worked with. And obviously, this is very important when it comes to um, looking for jobs. Okay, so these are platforms that you should definitely maintain if you are looking to to get a job in the academic space as well. Okay, guys, so just coming to a close now, you know, as, as the managing and production editor of, of Field, um, I'm obviously happy to answer any questions that you may have about the journal. If you are thinking about submitting your work, you know, just drop me a line uh, if you'd like to ask anything specific. You know, Field is open access and it belongs to all of us as uh, Southern African paleoscientists or, or paleoscientists on the African continent, I, sh I should say. So really, it is a space for us to, to all publish our, our work. You know, but before you contact me, please remember to go through the steps that I mentioned before. So then I can advise you as best as possible without having to tell you, you know, um, read the journal ambits, read the guidelines, etc., etc. Okay, so just go through all those steps, please. I obviously really encourage you all to publish. Doing so leave your, leaves your mark in this world. You know, really, you're leaving a legacy. Um, you, you, you really are publishing your thoughts and you're helping us understand our world a little bit better. And that's commendable and it is exciting, you know, learning more about the world. So, yeah, thanks very much. I hope you guys enjoyed the talk today.